Hello and welcome again to the Writer Review. This is Eric Rod Ryder, <clears throat> and this week we're going to be taking a look back at the 2003 uh, crime comedy uh, star, and it's titled uh, Matchstick Men. Now, Matchstick Men runs for one hour and 51 minutes long. It is uh, directed by Ridley Scott. It is produced by Ridley Scott, uh, Steve Starkey, Sean Bailey, Jack Rapke, and Ted Griffin. And uh, the script was written by Ted and Nicholas Griffin based on the novel Matchstick Men by Eric Garcia. The score was done by Hans Zimmer, the cinematography by John Matheson, and the editing was done by Dodie Dorn. And the stars of the movie are Nicolas Cage, Sam Rockwell, Alison Lohman, Bruce Altman, Bruce McGill, Sheila Kelly, Beth Grant, and Malora Walters. So after watching the film of a similar story to Matchstick Men called Confidence, where I summarized that the caper can easily be ruined by giving away details too early in the film. Well, lo and behold, uh, Matchstick Men, by way of contrast, well, no, not, not by contrast, by way of similarity, actually, uh, faces a very similar predicament as well. But, Unfor but fortunately, it can actually back up the intentions by definitely taking this route, this path, to a different direction. Like many keepers before, they kind of smugly believe that they're being clever to its viewers, taking us on their journeys, only to end up being formulaic and predictable. But what makes Matchstick Man work is that although the con doesn't light a candle, it's still able to connect its audience in the events proceeding up to the ultimate climax. So while the con in this movie, which was the primary focus, actually was the weakest spot, but what made up for the weak spots in this movie was the dynamic uh, chemistry within the characters. And that results in that the rest of the movie just really pans out splendidly. So sure, the whole Hustler backup could surely get on your nerves. Plus, the whole you know what you've got in your self's arrogance can pluck your eyeballs out of its socket. But it's the upbeat, sappy tone, snappy tone of the film, which is quite the contrast to the operatic soundtrack that you hear from a Ridley Scott film. The crooning sound of Bobby Darren, among others, along with the vibrant dialogue from each performer, everything just practically runs smoothly without a care in sight. And before you know it, the humming and the tapping comes into play as we enjoy the company of our leading protagonist two-thirds along the way in this film that just is barely under two hours long. Uh, so, yeah, on a technical level, the soundtrack is definitely an eye-opener here. It's just, I guess you could say, the big climax in the end is what really, really is the main primary elephant in the room, so to speak. It also helps that the cast seems pretty much spot on in their respective performances. I mean, we have Nicolas Cage. He's absolutely flawless in his performance as the obsessive compulsive con artist by the name of Roy Waller, whose neurotic demeanor upstages whatever con games he has up his sleeves. Meanwhile, his sidekick, Frank Mercer, played by Sam Rockwell, he is the suave, laid-back persona who can make you wonder if his friendship is genuine or superficial. They're just like the complete odd couple depicted here. And we often wonder, sometimes, you know, it's always the strong, silent types that you have to worry about. 
And in the case of Frank Mercer, that analogy really does kind of stand out. Makes you sometimes often wonder, is this guy to be trusted or not? That's basically practically up for the viewers to decide. Both performers definitely are capable of playing these roles in their sleep and both know how to manipulate each other of their civic duties. Cage definitely carries the heavier cargo as he battles Tourette's syndrome and sports constant nervous tics that can at times be nauseating. He also feverishly washes windows and eats tuna straight out of the can. He makes it seem authentic and natural. And I really, truly always enjoy Nicolas Cage when he's playing these neurotic type characters. He is definitely more fit for the comedy type of roles, the more dark comedy drama type roles. I never really quite dug him as an action star. I never really quite dug into this whole um, when he gets like into these action films. He's better in these kind of comedy, drama, heist type of films. And when he plays neurotic, over-the-top characters like these, he does it just so naturally. It just makes you think, this guy isn't just acting a role. He's living the role that he's playing. And he does that, and he does that very, very effectively. Rockwell also plays a role that you could like truly get invested in. Though he plays off more of a background character when he should actually be a second billing character. His screen time is like very, very, very limited. And yet he's supposed to be second billing. But maybe he should have been dropped about maybe third or fourth billing. I'm just saying. Sure, they're a pair of likable scoundrels, even though we're really not supposed to really like these guys because of their career paths. They've taken the road to being con artists. I mean, they'll, they'll squander your money. They'll do anything to, to make a buck off of you. And if you're gullible and stupid enough to bite into their bullshit, well, they're going to be the ones who will be walking home will be walking and laughing their way to the bank. And you can bank on that. So their work and their con games eventually comes to a pause as Roy is united with his teenager daughter, Angela, played by Allison Lohman, who's a prodigal waif who could easily con a person with the very best of them. She can at times be more of a liability than an asset to Roy and Frank, but as Roy starts to warm up to Angela, he starts to reconsider other avenues to make money. By the way, I want to say something about Alison Lohman's character of Angela. She was just really, really convincing in her respective role. She's playing a 14-year-old, when in reality, when this movie came out in 2003, she was actually about something like 23, 24 years old when this movie came out. So I thought that was actually pretty good that she's a character who's like in her early 20s, and yet she could pass off for playing an adolescent. That's what I call good, solid character acting. And, you know, very manipulative, but very effective. Aside from that, Lohman also has that eerie, eerily resemblance to a young Gina Davis from Thelma and Louise. And her convincing, naive ways, whether intentional or not, definitely can resemble Gina Davis from Thelma and Louise. 
Cajun Loman share definitely some great scenes together, has some great chemistry, which is clever and moving, as opposed to being saccharine and mushy. Sure, there's the father-daughter bonding here, but it's not like played as overkill. It does not just like water down this movie because this, I mean, let's face it, this movie will have a con game. It will have some forms of violence in this movie. It's a question of whether or not it's going to be effective towards this movie, whether it'll make this movie or whether it'll break this movie. It really just all depends if it actually has the the capability of making or breaking this movie. Does it feel in place with the story? You know, or is it just, you know, had it on just so that we can have ourselves a climax. If it's the other case, then that's just being lazy and it will drift apart and it'll be just pretty much null and void to what its intentions that this movie has. The film would have been pure gold if it would have stuck to the relationship between Roy and Angela but like I mentioned before, sadly, the big con had to come around sooner or later. And the filmmakers had this plan the whole time through. So while we're busy trying to see this con artist try to be on the goods with his adolescent daughter, struggling to actually play a father role, something he never really had much responsibility to do during his time since, you know, his ex-wife uh, or girlfriend dumped him and then she got pregnant and she never told him. So now, you know, he's struggling to, you know, like try to adapt to the needs and wants that an adolescent daughter comes with. So the scoundrel trifecta and their unfortunate guinea pig in the shape of Chuck Frechette, played by uh, Bruce McGill. Oh, my God, I, I got to tell you, Bruce McGill. He wasn't on for a, ver a lot of scenes, but by God, his character is fucking scary as hell. Definitely, he plays off kind of like a victim to the con games between Roy, Frank, and Angela. Chuck Frechette, he will resort to any scheming tactics possible. It seems that right from the first, but then the deceptions seem too obvious and definitely can be seen from a mile away. Once all that character development is definitely put to the pasture, it all comes down to big bad assassins armed with their heavy ammunition it just seems to spoil the apple cart from all the wonderful moments from the earlier scenes. So in the end, this whole con game, this whole con thing was just thrown in at the last minute just so that we could have a, an exciting, an exciting, conflicting climax where all it is is just a series of chases, guns, ammunition, and violence. When yet, the first 90 minutes of this movie is just saturated with, with you know, slow developing better acquaintance between father and daughter, including such attempts at cooking spaghetti only to end up ordering pizza. You know, silly stuff. Might seem a bit lighthearted at first. But then all of a sudden we have to have the big con, the big heist. And then all of a sudden this lighthearted, family friendly comedy turns into a much, much more darker area just around the 11th hour. So all of a sudden it all ends with chases, violence, and sheer brutality. Like, like right out of the flash of a pen. And it makes you wonder 
why did Scott keep why didn't Scott keep a good thing coming? And he ruins the scenes by softening up the hardened scenes, which is one apology too late. You've already done the damage, Ridley Scott. And now, thanks to your incompetence, we're all suffering for it. So, apology not well accepted. Sorry. I'm sure those non judgmental purists can definitely still enjoy the film as a whole. And you know, I'm going to tell you something. I don't really blame them for it. The positives still outnumber the negatives. The tame humor and the emotional chemistry is truly a delight to the soul. It's just a real elephant in this room was the big heist scene. Now, usually a lot of final climactic heist scenes can be exciting and and just totally surreal in its delivery. But here, it falls flat. It seems just completely out of, out of place. And I just don't think it just really fit in with the whole story. I'm sorry to say. Why did we need a big heist? There was no reason for it. And the heist just ends up falling flat on its face. It's still easy to forgive the flaws while marveling at the good qualities of this movie. It shows that Scott, Ridley Scott, can handle lighter fair films than his more heavier themed stuff. Matchstick men can stand alone for the unintended scenes contrary to the direction its mindset was on the whole time. So in the end, when all is said and done, um, I'm not going to say this was one of Ridley Scott's finer moments, but then again, I could say the same thing, that it's not one of Nicolas Cage's finer moments or Sam Rockwell's. Alison Lohman, she was really very convincing in her performance, you know, managing to successfully make us believe she's a teenager when she's actually really 24. Same could be said about um, all the performances are very good. Nicolas Cage, you know, like I said, he could play this kind of role in his sleep. Sam Rockwell is excellent as Frank Mercer, this calm and cool, eclectic individual, only to realize that the guy was a turncoat. He pulled it off very well. Bruce McGill, he was a badass. And, you know, I, I still find that this movie was still highly enjoyable. And yeah, even a climax scene, even though it felt out of place, can still be looked upon and regarded as a bit of a guilt trip. But it still just did not match the intentions of what this film was going for. So when all is said and done, if I was to give this movie a scale out of 10, I will give Matchstick Men a 7. Do I recommend this movie? I guess I do. But if you're expecting any high expectations, you know, depending on what kind of taste, but to me, don't expect any high expectations. Just an opinion. So I guess this ends my writer review. Thank you all for listening in. If you wish to subscribe to my YouTube channel, please feel free to do so. If you wish to leave a comment, go right ahead. But just remember, be kind, be courteous, and don't be rude. And I will be back again with another movie review. So until next time, this is Eric Rodrider saying, keep watching those movies, and I'll see you around. Goodbye.